It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday morning, everybody, and welcome to the VolQuest podcast. Eric Kane with the normal crew of Austin Price, Rob Lewis, and Brent Hubs. And as always, brought to you by Smoky Mountain Organics. If you're suffering from those spring and summer allergies, like many of us are, give Smoky Mountain Organics a shot today. It's East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store, focusing on natural products and organic remedies to a variety of ailments. Uh, visit one of the three locations in East Tennessee, including the one right here in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Trader Joe's, or you can visit online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. Plenty to discuss on this edition of the VolQuest podcast. Uh, we'll start with baseball, of course, on to Super Regionals. Uh, you know, obviously, a flair for the dramatics is this baseball team. It, Needed some late heroics against Campbell on Saturday nights. Uh, was trailing by one run in the bottom or heading to the top of the ninth inning on Sunday against Georgia Tech. Proceeded to score six and uh, withstand a little rally from the uh, Jackets in the bottom of the inning. But Tennessee on to Super Regionals for the second consecutive year, Brent Hubs. Quite an accomplishment. Yeah, and I mean, they, they've done it in a variety of ways. I mean, they, they did not play their best in the regional, um, you know, after not trailing in the SEC tournament uh, to come back and, and have to fight off a uh, Four run deficit on, on Saturday and Sunday to, to win the region to get to super regional play. Not their best baseball, uh, but I said it in around the horn with, with Ben after the, the game on, on Sunday. Rob, there's just something to be said for a collection of winners. You know, I mean, and that's just the bottom line with this team is they know how to win and they're a collection of winners. Yeah, I mean, this weekend, even be, being there in the stands. You know, Tennessee was going into the night. I mean, fans were not – I'm not going to say they weren't worried, but nobody was surprised that it worked out the way it did either night. I, I think that was in the building. And, and I think that's a, a, a reflection of this baseball team and the way they played all year. Yeah, I mean, they needed her. They needed some semblance of heroics on Sunday night. They did not need heroics on Saturday night, Kane. It was four to nothing before I got there. They just needed me. Because once I showed up, it was runs of plenty for the Vols. You know, what's what's amazing about this team, and and Tony Vitello has talked about this all season long, is that once you get to postseason play, Eric, uh, roles change. Nobody really has a role. You just do whatever it's called upon. And, and if you just say going in that that, that Mabry and, and Kirby Canal were, were going to last longer than Tennessee's two big arms, uh, you know, and, and, and Chase Dolender and and uh, Beam, I think most people would have said you were crazy. And, and for them to get to a region, they didn't even have to pitch Camden Sewell because they were saving him for the Monday game. Uh, tells you how deep they are and, and tells, you, tells you that everybody understands it's just kind of whatever it takes at this point in time. What, whatever you got to do, you got to do. And uh, I would expect Tennessee will play better against Notre Dame, but uh, Notre Dame is going to be a heck of a challenge for Tennessee. Should be a great uh, super regional with, with, you know, with the College World Series bid on the line. Kane, um, Notre Dame's record, pretty good, right? 30 and 14. I mean, you know, uh, but they haven't played a, a deep, deep schedule. They've, you know, lost to some ranked teams they've played. Um, they don't hit it that well, but they do pitch it well and they play good defense. And so, it, you know, I think a lot of it boils down to, how many times can Tennessee – I mean, I think Tennessee can win the series if they don't take them deep a lot. But I think they can sweep the series and run away from them if Tennessee can can hit several home runs Friday – or depending on when they start, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, I mean, I think so too. And, I mean, it's kind of the same for for every series. I mean, it has been all year. Um, it, it was heading into Hoover. It was heading into regional play. I mean, if Tennessee just plays this game, that it should have you know, no issue at all. Now, no game is ever going to be perfect. The Notre, Notre Dame is going to present a lot of challenges – a team that a lot of people believe that, you know, thought, you know, might be a host site for regional play, but ended up going to the Statesboro Regional, beat a good Texas Tech team twice, and, you know, here they are coming to Knoxville. Um, what's more, you know, what what's the bigger takeaway here? I have a question for you guys. Is it Tennessee, you know, the concern of Tennessee falling behind early two nights in a row, which that's not much of a concern for me because, again, it's early, and, you know, you battle back and you have time to come back. But nonetheless, you don't want to be in that predicament. But is it falling behind early or – the confidence now added with, as you pointed out, Brent, you know, Kirby Connell and, and Will Mabry coming in and, and finding just new ways to win baseball games. I take more away from that than the early deficits. Yeah, I, I don't get I don't get caught up in in this team, Rob, and, and the fact that maybe they didn't play their best. Their, their best all year long has still got them, um, 
even when they haven't been at their best, it, it's gotten them a, a school record number of wins. Uh, they're the number one team in the country, and everybody knows it. I, I think they've clearly been the best team in the country. So, so my takeaway is that it's more of them finding a way than it is the fact that, that they, they fell behind. I, I don't know this, Rob, but I wonder if a regional is harder than a super regional. It is, in my opinion. I 100% agree. Yeah. I, I, I was just saying, I, the fall behind part doesn't wouldn't bother me at all if I'm a Tennessee fan. And I'm, I mean, I'm kind of like you, Hubbard. I wonder if this, I don't know if, if the regional's harder for everybody, but I wonder when you're the number one overall seed and everybody's gunning for you, you've got the bullseye on your back. I, I, I almost wonder if it's not more difficult to come out and, you know, not just not fall flat on your face in, in the regional as opposed to, this next weekend where you, where you kind of get your feet under you. And I'm not saying there's, there still can't be some Cinderella's, but I, and I think in, in watching baseball the past couple of years, it seems like, you know, C- Cinderella is probably more prone to, to show up at this first weekend than, than next weekend. Yeah. Wright state last year, Campbell this year, those are good solid teams. They could hit the ball and then no pressure on it. Like they weren't expected to do anything. So, so when Campbell comes out and they go homer, 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 double, double against Georgia Tech in the second inning, and they get five runs, it just adds to the confidence. Then they come out against Tennessee, big hit, big hit, home run. I mean, there was no pressure on them. But once they kind of got smacked back in the mouth, they didn't have the pitching to withstand it. So I agree. I, I think when you face certain teams and that are, you know, it's – it's it's becoming a lot like the NCAA basketball tournament from a standpoint of, and then baseball is even more finicky. Um, you know, some of these smaller teams still have good teams. Think about it, Dolander Lander was at Georgia Southern a year ago. Georgia Southern, what, was what, kind of one seed? I mean, like, yeah. you know, but like when you think about Georgia Southern, you don't, I mean, you think good baseball, not one seed maybe, but they're really good. And then you look at a team like Campbell, no name team from North Carolina, they can just, they can, they can, they can rake, man. Yeah, they can hit it for sure. I think the other takeaway from me, Eric, as as you were asking earlier about the big takeaways, is the fact that this team handled the pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, but because I mean they played with they played with house money for a month and a half, right? I mean everybody knew they were going to host. Everybody knew that. I mean the, the the prize has been Omaha, and, and and so you go and lose two or three Kentucky. That makes you mad. You're not happy, but it's not the end of the world, right? No big deal. Even if you go to Hoover and you don't win the SEC tournament, it's really no big deal. It's a big deal now because if you lose, you're done. And, and so the pressure is all on Tennessee to get there, and, and the pressure is on Tennessee to to get it done. And and the fact that they fell down four nothing in that Saturday game, which to me is the must-win game of a regional to stay out of that loser's bracket because it's such a dog fight uh, if you lose that second game. For them to handle that moment and that pressure the way that they did, I think that's a takeaway because I wondered about how this team would respond in those kind of moments when the the pressure got real because they haven't had pressure on them really all season long. They're Mm -hmm. good. They know they're good. That They locked up a regional before – uh, there was still frost on the on the ground when Tennessee locked up a regional bid. So, um, you, you know, the, that's the other takeaway for me. It's how they responded when some adversity hit them in a pressure situation. It'll be interesting to see kind of, you know, the, the pitching plans moving forward. And last thing I'll say on this weekend, then we'll move on. Um, I know it's an all-hands-on-deck approach now that you're in postseason. You're to supers. Uh, literally, whatever it takes to get the job done, because as we saw across the country this weekend, baseball's been crazy, Right. Uh, Drew Beam, um, you know, is there concern there? Chase Burns coming out of the bullpen. I, I think that keep staying with Drew Beam in a starting role, having Chase Burns there to piggyback and come in if needed. Obviously, Camden Sewell was not used this weekend out of precaution, and obviously for a Monday game potentially. Um, you know, maybe that bat, that number three starter moving forward. Um, I'll, I'll be intrigued to see how Tony wants to play that, but I, I would assume that it'll probably just stay the same. Um, also, you know, you get back into a normal routine this weekend with Super Regionals going back to – which one's harder, regional player supers, at least from a routine aspect, and baseball players are, you know, are, uh, you know, creatures of nature, right? And, um, you know, a creature of habit, rather. And you get back into a, a normal three-game series when you only need to win two of them. So um, outside of the games uh, this past weekend in the Knoxville Regional, Tennessee will move on now and play, uh, play Notre Dame. Um, Tennessee also announced some renovations, the renderings for the new Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Uh, no beginning date has been set in stone on when the – 
renovations will begin. No uh, completion date has been set in stone regardless, but Danny Watt came out, made some comments. They put a, a story out there at uh, you know, Tennessee release a, a, a feature on it uh, late last week, and you're going to have new suites, an enhanced left field porch, extended seating down the left field line, uh, new box seating, additional club seating, and obviously the indoor training complex out behind the right field wall. Uh, Austin, it looks, I mean, it looks like it's going to be something when it's all said and done, just a matter of how quickly can they get this done? I, I wouldn't hold your breath. It'll be done quickly. No, I, I would venture to say it'll be done for the start of the 2024 season. It's kind of how I would look at that. Um, I, I'll say this. I mean, it's, it, the renderings are second only to the, uh, the new VolQuest corporate headquarters uh, that Brent's <laughs> building for us, but uh, it, it is impressive. I, I, I I like how they're going to do some different things, uh, but keep the the framework of the stadium somewhat similar. Um, I like that they're going to move that road. Uh, you know, um, at least it, it, that's how it appears in the in the rendering subs. Is they're going to they're going to maybe make that that road back there behind the the outfield more round. Maybe that's I'm just wrong there. But how you go put that building in, um, unless you're just going to do it right up against the curb, where the the big turn is. What were your takes, subs? Well, I mean, my takeaway from a timeline standpoint is, I mean, the, the contractor and, and the architect and all that stuff can't officially take place until the month of July. Okay. So then you get those guys in and then you got to start drawing and then you get into Rob from those renderings. What's, what's real and what's not real it, is something that's drawn in a rendering, not possible when you get into really diving into the construction plan or can it all handle, you know, can it all happen the way exact, exactly how it's laid out? Typically there's some tweaks there. Uh, but, but I, I like what they've done. You know, they're going to try to maximize that footprint and keep it the hornet's nest. And, and, um, I, I think that's the, the best thing going at Lindsay Nelson stadium right now is yeah, it's dilapidated in so many places, but when, when that thing is full and, and when that thing is, when it matters and it counts, it's a hard place to play baseball. It was a hard place for Georgia Tech to play baseball in in the ninth inning um, on on Sunday night, and and when when Tennessee fans smelled blood in the water, Rob, it was. I mean, it, it's a college baseball atmosphere that a lot of people around the country are jealous of, even though it's not the finest of amenities in that facility right now. No, I mean that that place was popping. I mean, all weekend long, and and while you're there, you wonder, man, what would it be like if there were eight thousand people in here, or nine thousand people, or or 10,000, but then Hover, you know, I mean, the downside of that is what would it be like third weekend in March, you know, when it's 45 degrees out and you had an 8,000 seat stadium. And I think that's, don't you kind of think that's the juggling act guys is, but what about, you know, what's it look like if you have an eight, 8,500 seat, you know, building and, and it's half full. Yeah, You don't want it to be a mausoleum. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you, you look at Mississippi state's beautiful right? I mean, it's a, it's an unbelievable facility aside from the, apparently the press box views. Um, but, but the rest of it is, is an unbelievable deal, but it's too big. I mean, they, they, you know, basically in the regular season, they sell it out one weekend every other year when, when Ole Miss comes to town. Uh, otherwise it's not, it's not a hard ticket. Uh, there's a supply and demand issue there. You, you want the demand to be greater than your supply. And I think Danny White understands that. That's something what we talked about uh, when we had our conversation or sit down. I asked him about, you know, space. And that's when he started talking about the standing room only stuff. And I, I think you would like to have that facility look full, you know, and, and feel full on a, on a midweek, you know, or a weekend series in March. And then it expands and becomes – uh, an even livelier atmosphere with more people in there in regional place. So you can expand it out with some standing rooms type stuff. So I, I think that's what you're going to see. I, I think you're going to see a stadium that's going to see 62 to 68 or 7,000 at most. And, and then I think when you get into regional play, that stadium might be able to expand to 7,500, 7,700, you know, if, if the, uh, if the, 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 the demand warrants it where, where your baseball team is. I just don't think they want to build, and, and I don't think they want to build a huge stadium. I think they want to keep it kind of cozy, and, and they want to keep it a hard place to play, but they want it to be able to expand when they get into regional and super regional play with standard and, room only stuff. And they want the amenities to be nice. Over there. Yeah, the amenities. Got, I mean, and that's the thing, too. I mean, the, your amenities have to be nice. Bells and whistles, however, bells and whistles. Well, there's no doubt about it. Because here's the thing. I mean, look, this weekend, everybody's dialed into baseball. 
right? I mean, everybody, cause, because there's pressure. You know, you lose and you go home. But other weekends, you guys have been there. You go out on the porch, it's a social scene. You watch a little baseball, you talk to a lot of people. You eat a hot dog, you hang out, you you know, you, you, you get a beverage, and, and then you turn and you catch a little more baseball. And then if it gets really interesting late, you get really focused on baseball. But it's a social atmosphere. And, and I don't think Danny White, and, and Danny White understands that, he's not going to lose that, which is why the amenities portion of that's so important for baseball. And regardless of what it officially looks like when what, what it's all said and done, um, it's going to be on par, if not better than – the likes of others in the SEC and in college baseball. And that's what you need if you're going to be a perennial power you know, year in and year out because, you know, obviously Tony's doing a good job of recruiting and developing, but it's tough to bring recruits through the front door there at Lindsay Nelson Stadium. This is something that, of course, we've known for a long time. Well, you've got you got to get – I mean, first of all, you got to get that building built for, for, mm-hmm. for the athletes because the, the suites and all that stuff, those amenities don't matter for the athletes. So you got to take care of the student athlete there. Um but I mean, l- l- I mean, how many renderings have we gone through the last 15 years on Lindsey Nelson Stadium? Five, six? I mean, there's probably been more renderings of baseball renovations than there have been Neyland Stadium renovations, which is a heck of a statement. Well, Maybe well, we're well, finally going to get to that point. One high-level donor told me this weekend, hover out on the porch, when they said, "What did you, somebody asked him, what did you think of the renderings? And he goes, that's only workup number 333. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, like, it was like, you know, I mean, he's like, he's like, until we get to the point where I actually see the thing, it's kind of hard to just kind of wrap your mind around it because I've seen so many of them. Well, for the first time ever though, it is on the docket. It is on the state document for funding and uh, it's never gotten to that point uh, before. And so, uh, I mean, it's well on its way. It's going to happen uh, probably slower than everybody wants, but it, at least it's on the, on the, the books for the first time, despite all the other renderings that have been out there. You definitely want to continue to, you want to, you want to, you know, finish out the renovations for Neyland. You want to do, you know, you, you want to finish out baseball or redo baseball, obviously. But other than that, man, like all, not to poop on other sports, but like at the end of the day, like you're asking all these donors, give the NIL, give to the funds, give to, you know, give to this, give to that. I mean, like there's only so much money to go around. At some point, it's going to have to go back to you want toilets or you want talent, you know. And so, like, that's kind of where, you know, I think, you know, you want to see them once they get these couple of projects they have on the books, as Hub said, done, the focus to go the other way. Well, so, and that's and, and that's why the premium seating for, for all the facilities are so important, because that premium seating is going to fund the toilets. It's going to fund the concourse stuff. That That's why, whether people like it or not, that's why the West in clubs, new club seats in Neyland Stadium are so important because the money they're going to make off of those premium seats are going to help fund the next renovation project. And when they do club seating or premium seating in the south end zone or in the east on the east side, that's going to fund the next phase. And, And that has to be a part of this project because you know, you're not going to get single or two or three donors. The other thing too is I'll see where Danny will be curious to see where Danny white is on some corporate sales too. You know, are, is he going to sell sections to a corporate donor on a 10 year, you know, kind of a 10 year note, Kentucky's done a hell of a job with that in their football stadium. Uh, the Woodford reserve stuff that they did for their premium seating that Kentucky has helped pay for a lot of stuff there. Is that potentially a phase for Tennessee out there next? I think it's certainly something that Tennessee would like to try to do. They're not going to rename Neyland Stadium. It's not. It's not going to become, you know, Walgreens Field or whatever that way. But but in certain premium sections, maybe you get a corporate sponsorship there to help pay for things. No, but could the North End Zone, the new addition up there with the jumbotron, could that be, you know, some type of you know, corporate you know sure. landing? you know, area, whatever. Maybe Gus is landing. I mean, what, what, yeah, what, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but what you do is you get those guys on a 10 year note yes, you know, and, and get them to give you money every 10 years. And, and then you're using that money to help pay for things that that's how you have to go about doing this. Cause you can't just go in debt for $400 million to renovate Neyland stadium. And you can't just say, Hey, we got a blank check for Lindsay Nelson stadium. You're going to have to fund some things through premium seating. That's the, that's the trend. Just wait till the G, wait till they rename the gates and it's no longer Gate Twenty One and it's like meet me at Chick Fil A Gate <laughs> <laughs> and bring your sauce. <laughs> Plenty of uh, baseball stuff up on the front page of BallQuest.com. Of course, a couple of different Diamond Balls podcasts are up there, and 
A lot of stuff leading up into the Super Regionals later this weekend. Let's shift gears here, AP. Let's uh, let, let's get the word on Savion Herring uh, out of Monroe Community College, Tennessee, adding some depth to its interior of the offensive line heading into the new season. A guy that can play all five positions, but more, he's a, he's a guard. Uh, he started at right guard for Monroe Community College, a former a three-star out of high school, former commit to the University of uh, to Cincinnati, uh, but went to Monroe, and now will have three years of eligibility remaining coming to Tennessee, a guy that at least is going to be a depth option for Glenn Ellerby. Yeah, and another body in the room, um, and we'll see you know, if he's able to progress. You know, I mean, I do think he's an athletic kid, um, you know, and, and they're going to start him at guard. You know, I don't see him playing tackle, um, but he's played it before. So, I mean, he, I guess, an emergency role, you know, but a lot of those guys – you know, have played it at some point, whether even be in high school. I mean, most, most, most guards in high school play tackle unless you're just mammoth. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll see where it happens, um, you know, going forward, but I, it's good that he's here already and can kind of get going and have both sessions of summer school, both sessions in the weight room and kind of, uh, you know, immerse himself uh, in the program before fall camp gets here, because, you know, once, you know, August hits, man, it's a whirlwind for those 30 days or so. A couple of prospect camps as well over the past week. Uh, had one on Wednesday night, then one uh, the night at Neyland, which was uh, on the Haslam practice field because, of course, the construction at Neyland Stadium. Um, one notable guy that stood out to me and, uh, you know, to you guys who are there as well, uh, Carson Gentle. Um, you know, he's a guy out of Macaulay in the Chattanooga area. Came up uh, to the night at Neyland last year, picked up an offer from the University of Tennessee. When I had a chance to talk to him, he said, hey, you know, last year was about getting an offer. This year was about – impressing the coaches and seeing what I could take from these coaches. You know, the other night on Saturday night, he was easily the most impressive guy. One of the more impressive guys out there, um, you know, him. And then of course there was a 2025 quarterback that really, uh, you know, raised some eyebrows. Well, there were two, uh, one on Wednesday, that being Tavian St. Clair kid from, uh, uh, Bella Fontaine, Ohio. Um, you know, of course, you know, we all know how that goes. Like if Ohio state goes hard on him, those Ohio kids normally go to Ohio state. Um, but especially quarterbacks, but you know, really good looking player. Thought he threw it really, really well. Um, and then you had Antoine Hill Jr., who's out of the state of Georgia. Um, you know, Rodney Garner's got a, a previous relationship there. Um, he's also a 2025, and he and he threw it. Well, he was very – both of them were really impressive, uh, both throwing it and then interview-wise afterwards, like very polished, you know, for a kid that's 14, 15 years old, handled himself, complete sentences, uh, you know, was thought-provoking. Um, real impressed with both of those kids. I mean, it, it, the, the hard part is, is like, you know, I just think, you know, a year ago, a lot of those kids were flocking to some camps just because they hadn't had any. Now a lot of the kids, you know, especially the 23s, they don't camp unless you're trying to earn something. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see a few 24s here and there. Tennessee will have a seven-on-seven seven, uh, day coming up on Thursday. Expect Demetrius Bell and Blackman to be in town for that. Um, and then they'll have another prospect camp coming up uh, on Sunday, the 12th in the afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, this is the, to me, this is the first real sign that you're kind of past the COVID deal. Uh, I know coaches have been on the road for them that, you know, that's a big deal that, that it's a big sign. But when you look at the camp numbers and you look at who is camping, this is, you know, a year ago, there were so many kids who felt like they just needed to go show themselves to have a chance to be recruited because coaches had not been on the road evaluating them and recruiting them. And now it's kind of shifted back to where it was pre-COVID. And the, the kids in the 22s and 23s, you know, they're they're in the Crocs and the flip-flops looking for the tour and the photo shoot, or kind of walking around. And it's the 24s and 25s who are trying to impress. Um, and, and so you're kind of getting back to that cycle. I think that's why camps feel different this year than they have in previous years because you go back to that night at Neyland last year, there were a lot of big name guys there who are trying, who ended up being big name guys who were trying to prove themselves to people because they hadn't been seen. It's just a different, it's just shifted. Pat, we're finally past the COVID, that part of it from the COVID setback that we had. Yeah. I mean, I do think there's more kids scheduled to be here like this Sunday for the 12th and the 26th um, as far as, you know, more big timers in the 24 and 25 class. The other night for me was disappointing. I just didn't feel like there was a whole lot there. But again, you talk about just, you know, kids trying to balance schedules and everything. And, you know, there's seven on seven coaches taking a group of kids here and taking the kids there. You got, you know, kids locked in to go to this school for, for a day. And then 
they pivot. So, you know, it should be a better group of kids this Sunday and then following the 26th. Yeah, the number's a little bleak there at uh, the Not in Nayland the other night. Um, again, not at only- Haslam. Night at Haslam the other night, uh, not not a whole lot there. But again, there there was there was uh, a huge number, huge number earlier in the week. Of course, there was a lot of walk ins that came in that night, uh, but more expected to be here on Sunday. Hey, last thing, guys, um, and something Brent that you put in the war room last week, um, the the BOLS letters. Uh, Danny White teasing that it's uh, coming back to Neyland Stadium, and according to the tweet that he put out there, it looks like it's going to be the orange blocks, the white letters. Rob, I know this is something that a lot of fans truly cared about and a lot of fans wanted to see back at Neyland Stadium, and it looks like Danny White's going to do just that. Yeah, and Hubbard, uh, this is gonna, it's going to be lost on the other two, but I, I bet you'll be able to identify. I, I saw Michael Jackson on the Victory Tour, two seats, two rows in front of the V in the VOL side. That's how high there's, up I was. There you go. That's exactly right. When, when they rolled in. I mean, I, I, I tweeted this out. I mean, those letters have been a variety of, have been done in a variety of different styles through the years. At one point, there was a black line under the letters. Um, then there were the, the the white backgrounds with the orange letters, and then there were the orange backgrounds with the white letters. For me, as a kid growing up, you know, and I can remember not even going to the games, but you remember coming across the South Knoxville Bridge or um, you know the Gay Street Bridge or whatever, and, and you look and you saw those iconic letters with, with the orange background and, and the white letters that that's that was always the the scene for me what's interesting is there's not a lot of details as to how those came about why they went and put those up when they did uh they just kind of showed up i guess that falls under a doug dickey deal uh back in the 60s but they just kind of emerged nobody really knows kind of the origin or, or why those things came about um but i, I think they're gonna look great i, I think they're it, you know, you're always threading that needle, as Danny White says, between tradition and progression. And uh, that's a traditional thing that was easy to do. And, and to put one on each side of the Jumbotron and those old iconic looks with now the LED lights that you can incorporate in your light show, I think you're threading that needle pretty well. Danny White's pushing a lot of right buttons right now, it feels like. I was going to say, not only with the pregame light show, but I mean, during the the Vols chance and after touchdowns, I mean, there's awesome. There's a lot of room there to really incorporate those and fan uh, enhance fan experience i think it could look pretty good yeah they were actually crafted by sven thorn bjornsson from sweden in 1957 <laughs> hub um <laughs> can't believe you didn't know that uh i can tell you i can tell you where i can tell you who'll tell you where they're crafted and that's gus manning his right. mind is still still super super sharp and and i he probably would be my, one of the few people that actually would know where they would come from right i mean yep. And just not me. I mean, I, maybe Coach Dickey could tell you, but I mean, I like, Roger Frazier knows. <sighs> no, I don't know if he knows, but he can tell you where the, the orange dog is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll why say- do they go away? I mean, I was like four years old when they. I mean, because they left in what ninety nine. Like, why do they? Why do they leave the? the well, they 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 put them on top of the jumbotron at one point in a different style of letters. They went away when they put the jumbotron up in the south end zone. It's when they okay. went away. Then they put a smaller version of them up above the top of the jumbotron. But they were kind of heavy. Yeah, man, they were too tall, and there was some issue there. And then they restructured that jumbotron and put the power T and in, in the word Neyland Stadium in it, and did it differently there. I, I mentioned this in the war room, and and this is where I think a lot of fans appreciate Danny White. I was sitting there at, at the Big Orange Countdown pregame show. We were in a commercial break, and Jason Swain turned to Danny White and said, "You need to bring the letters back." And Danny White was like, I don't even know what you're, I mean, like, basically, I don't know what you're talking about. What are, you, what are you doing? And Jason pulled up a picture. He said, people go bananas over these things. They miss these letters. I miss the letters. You ought to find a way to bring the letters back when you do the renovations. And Danny White said, well, we'll look into it. Certainly we'll do that. And then all of a sudden, here we are. You know, and so I give him credit. He all of a sudden, they were sitting outside the stadium a few weeks later for pictures. But but here they are putting in. I mean, that's a smart move from a PR standpoint by a, a, a group of individuals who come in who quote aren't Tennessee guys and don't know Tennessee. Well, it take your wins where you can get them, right? That's I mean, right. That's an easy win, Hubs. I mean, the layup. Like, the layup. You're right. Take the layup. I mean, bringing them out there just to just so fans could pose for pictures uh, before games. I mean, that that was the easiest thing in the world to do, and so um, I give him credit for that. But you're right, Brent. He, Danny White is certainly pushing a lot of right buttons here lately, and um, you know, got a lot of people fired up, especially with those <laughs> renovations pending for Lindsey Nelson Stadium. 
All right, that's going to do it here for this edition of the Vol Quest podcast. Plenty of stuff coming up this week. Of course, the Tennessee prepares uh, to take on Notre Dame in Super Regional play. We'll have the mailbag on Thursday. A lot of recruiting stuff up there as the week goes on. And again, a special shout out to Smoky Mountain Organics. Uh, visit one of the three locations located in East Tennessee, including the one right here in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Trader Joe's, or you can shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. For Awesome Price, Rob Lewis and Brent Hubs, I am Eric Kane. Thanks so much for listening to us here on the VolQuest Podcast. You've been listening to the VolQuest Podcast every week here on VolQuest.